Hey y'all, my name is Amber Rodriguez and I'm part of the teaching team for our time together in Hebrews. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. How do you approach Bible study? Do you see the Bible as a love letter from the Lord or maybe historical evidence of the Christian faith? Or maybe you see it as a way to become a better person, perhaps maybe a guide for right Christian living. While the Bible can do these things, if we come to the word of God with this mindset, then we risk not gaining from the Bible what the Holy Spirit longs to do in our hearts as individuals and in our hearts as the collective body of believers. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Actually close your eyes. I want you to imagine that you have been extended a very personal invitation to a dinner. You walk into a room, it's elaborately prepared. The table is adorned with beautiful flowers, beautiful table linens. There's a place setting at each chair and your name is neatly written at each spot. You notice that this is gonna be the most elaborate meal that you have ever had. It's a multi-course meal. You are gonna walk away satisfied and not hungry. You take, your, you take your chair, you pull it back and you sit down, waiting in anticipation for that first course to arrive. But instead, you get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of milk. How would you feel afterwards, knowing that you had this grand opportunity for this fantastic, spectacular, once in a lifetime meal, and you walked away with a PB&J? I mean, pretty good. Your hunger would be satisfied. You'd have some energy for the day, but somehow you would feel disappointed. I know I would. And that's what we want to avoid happening when we approach our time in God's word. God's word is living, it is active. It discerns our thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. We come to our God naked and exposed to the eyes of our shepherd and we are the sheep of his pasture as the psalmist declared earlier. He knows how to perfectly care for us. And so we have this collection of books, his word written by human authors, fully inspired by our creator through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we don't wanna walk away from our time in his word, like we've walked away having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. When what was offered was the most elaborate multi-course meal specifically prepared for each one of us. And so we're gonna start our journey with the study of Hebrews in this first session by going over its context, along with a brief overview of the old covenant priesthood. You know, sometimes studying the context of a particular book can seem a little tedious and maybe not much spiritual value, but if we really understand each part of the context and what it can provide, it impacts our study and it can demystify that book. It allows us to evaluate and see God in the story and how he wants to change our hearts and our minds. And the good news is we don't have to go to seminary to learn how to understand, explain, or interpret a text. 
So we're gonna start with those five context questions. We're gonna discuss the author of the text, when the text was written, the audience, the style of writing, and why the book of Hebrews was written. Within each category, we're going to determine how it helps us to really engage with the text, opening up our hearts and our minds to the work of the Holy Spirit. So for our first question, who is the author? Countless scholars and many attempts have been made to determine who wrote the book of Hebrews, but it is largely unknown. Some theories include Paul, Apollos, Barnabas. Some even believe that it may have been a woman. But you know what? Not knowing the author does not take away from the validity or the truth of the book of Hebrews. We do know that the author is a master of Greek that is unmatched anywhere else in the New Testament and that their theological themes have been powerfully argued using a very persuasive strategy that adheres to the classical way of argument during that time period. The author would repeat main ideas often and from a variety of angles. This will become apparent when we study the book, the chapter on angels. It's written with a, ser a serious tone and there are compelling appeals and warnings that have eternal consequences for the audience. The uncertainty again of the authorship should not affect our confidence in the authority of the scripture because the author states in chapter two that this message is declared by the Lord and the apostles. Okay, so we have answered our first question, the author. We are gonna move on to our next question, when. In this category, we're also gonna discuss the meta narrative. This helps us to understand how it would have been read by the original audience, how it speaks uniquely to their moment in history. And where it fits into the meta narrative, or in other words, the big story of the Bible, ultimately helps us to apply it to our lives today. So that meta narrative or big story, it explains the smaller stories or themes of the Bible. It ultimately shapes our understanding of the whole message of the Bible, which falls into the creation, the fall, redemption, or restoration. And Hebrews fits into the redemption part of the meta narrative. The definition of redemption is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Again, the psalmist in 111 says, He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Luke tells us, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Isn't it like our God to provide a, a redemption that we live in here, but also a further redemption that is to come? Paul tells us in Romans, we ourselves who, ha who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What a beautiful hope we have to look forward to. And finally, our author tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter nine, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made by hands that is of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by the means of, of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, securing an eternal redemption. Praise the Lord. So when 
was this written? It was likely written in the first century, in the mid-60s, but before the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD. This time frame is when a lot of the New Testament was written by the other known authors. Where the book is written is unknown. Okay, so we have covered that second question. We're going to move on to the third. Who is the audience? So as I alluded to earlier, the message of the Bible transcends to us today. But we need to remember that the book of Hebrews cannot be separated from its original audience. This is a powerful part of the context because so much of what we see in man's heart today has always been a part of man's heart across history. And so we are connected to this story, even though it's present day. If we overlook the original audience, then we run the risk of misapplying scripture. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart wrote, a text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its author or his or her readers. A text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its authors or his or her readers. And the audience of Hebrews can help us further make some sense of the book. In general, the audience is primarily Jewish Christians who are living in Rome or in or near Palestine. They grew up in Judaism, but they have chosen to follow their long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ. The author clearly knew the recipients of the letter and longed to be reunited with them, as the author states in chapter 13. Again, the author and the audience had a mutual friend in Timothy, which the author also states in chapter 13. Additionally, the audience seemed to have experienced significant persecution and opposition. All right, our next question, context question, the style of writing. The style of writing is an epistle, which is a letter addressing a specific situation or concern facing a church or a group of believers at a specific time in history. Knowing the style or the genre of writing helps us to expand our understanding of who God is and his authority over heaven and earth and his word. It is a sermon type letter, like I said earlier, with a lot of appeals and warnings to the audience. And these appeals and warnings, they have eternal consequences for them and for us today. All right, here we are. We are at our last context question. Why was the book of Hebrews written? You know, knowing why something is written keeps us from reading it solely for our own purposes. As I stated earlier, these early Jewish Christians, early Jewish Christ followers, were facing extreme persecution and opposition. However, they seemed to have been contemplating a compromise. They wanted to return to the old ways of the sacrificial system. They wanted something that felt familiar. They were starting to doubt this whole Jesus thing. Is he really the Messiah? Did he really rise from the dead? That kind of seems impossible. I'm starting to hear rumors that this really didn't happen. Could I have been duped? Did he really reconcile me to God? Could he have even done that? What about all the rules that we have to follow? This just does not seem right. And man, does this feel hard. Does this sound familiar? How many times do we doubt Jesus is better? What things of this world do we turn to seeking peace and comfort and hope? Do you see yourself in the audience of the book of Hebrews? I know I do. The author is seeking to proclaim and encourage them to hold fast and to remember that Christ is superior. Christ is superior to all things. Christ is superior to all people. 
Christ is superior to all places and Christ is superior to all rules. Jesus is not just better. He is superior to anything and to everything. All right, we have finished our context. So we're gonna pivot a little bit to do an overview of our time together in Hebrews. While there are 13 chapters in this epistle, over the next seven sessions, we will be concentrating on chapters one through the first part of chapter eight of the book, focusing on how Jesus is the superior to angels. Jesus is the superior to Moses and Jesus is the superior great high priest. Additionally, our teachers are going to cover three primary warnings our author diligently communicates within his letter. How many of you are Star Wars fans? I didn't watch the movies until well into adulthood, so I had the benefit of watching episodes one through three first, which reveal the downfall of Anakin Skywalker succumbing to the dark side by becoming Darth Vader. Watching them in numerical order gave me a greater understanding of the entire story of Darth Vader and his son, Luke. Without those first three episodes, the viewer is left with a lot of unanswered questions and the true meaning of the story isn't fully realized. We find ourselves in a similar situation with the book of Hebrews. Without a basic understanding of the priesthood, and the Old Covenant established in the Old Testament, we are left with only a vague grasp of what it means for us to even have the superior high priest, for us to even have the better covenant. So let's gain some perspective together by walking through some of the Old Testament. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. We're gonna read Genesis 17 verses one through eight. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God almighty, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and you may multiply and, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. We see a God who draws near, a God who identifies himself, a God who initiates, a God who seeks, a God who desires to establish a covenant, or in other words, an alliance with Abraham. This God, El Shaddai, the God Almighty, calls for Abram to walk before him, to be blameless, to turn away from evil, to walk with the Lord, allowing the Lord's righteousness to guard him, him, you, and me. So God offered then a covenant with this man, Abram, and what was Abram's response? The scripture we read says, Abram fell on his face in agreement. This is not a God who forces us into submission, but offers exactly what we need and then allows us to choose him. And so God in turn gave him a new name, Abraham. 
and thus a new identity with a promise of a place of purpose, one that would last through eternity, everlasting. This covenant extended to the generations that would come after Abraham, and we are a part of that promise. God kept his promise to Abraham, providing a son, Isaac, and then multiple generations after him. Okay, we are going to fast forward to the book of Exodus in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God observed them. God heard them. And God remembered his covenant. God brought them out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and led them through to a wilderness. It was in this wilderness that God provided food. God provided his presence. He provided his law, the priesthood, and God confirmed once again his covenant with his people. And how did they respond? Did they respond like Abraham falling on their faces? Well, not exactly. Israel would begin to doubt the faithfulness of God. It seems they would forget about the miraculous events that God used to free them from the oppression in the house of slavery. The people would ultimately become weary in the waiting and turn to idols and customs they were familiar with from their time in Egypt in the house of slavery. And so Israel creates a breach in the covenant. But God, he is a God who will always keep his covenant. He will keep his alliance, his promise. Even when Israel turns away, even when Israel doubts, even when Israel looks for things to bring security even when Israel looks for their identity elsewhere, their God still remembers them. He still sees them. He still longs to be their God and to dwell among them despite their ongoing struggle between obedience and disobedience. It is here in Exodus where we find God telling Moses that Aaron will be his priest. He gives very detailed instructions about what Aaron will wear, how he will meet with God and all the rules and regulations for Aaron and the subsequent priests that will follow Aaron. There would be a requirement of different types of sacrifices in order for the high priest to even be worthy of entrance into the temple. This is a God who continually wants to be with his people He longs to be with them and he longs for them to follow him. And he still longs for him to be with us today and for us to follow him today. This old covenant and priesthood was flawed. Under it, only the great, only the high priest could enter into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies and only once a year for the day of atonement. The people were excluded from the divine presence of God because of their sinfulness, which only further separated them from coming near to him. And this remained a central part of Israel's history. While they continued to seek other forms of security, identity, and satisfaction, this system provided a framework for their need and their access to God. It was a reminder that they needed something different. Israel would continue to waver between obedience and disobedience throughout its history. But God, he remained faithful even when they weren't. And he remains faithful even when we aren't. Then we see Jesus, the promised Messiah, enter onto the scene 
this long-awaited, promised Messiah, the unexpected king who ushered in a new and better covenant by becoming the superior high priest, a new covenant for all people desiring to follow Jesus, not just Israel, but anyone wanting to come to the Lord. And now we find ourselves at the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews gives us great clarity and wonder about Jesus. Clearly, the author is in awe and reverence and assurance about who Jesus is. And perhaps you are too. Or maybe you remember a time when you once felt that way about Jesus. Perhaps you've been wooed by our culture and society to think that something is better than Jesus. I know I have. When we are in the midst of suffering, it's easy to look to something or someone other than Christ. And just like the audience of Hebrews, we are being called to hold fast to what is best, Jesus. We are being called to an endurance that is everlasting. The author urges the original audience and us to run with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the founder, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. And so I ask you to consider this today. Have you accepted Jesus as your true and better? Is Jesus your best? Have you accepted Jesus as the author and the perfecter of your faith? Is Jesus your best? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is living and active. I thank you that it discerns the intentions of our hearts, Lord. And I thank you that we can come to you with boldness and confidence to your throne. You hear us. Your sacrifice, Jesus, was once and for all. And we praise your name and I thank you for this time. I thank you that we get to spend time together in the book of Hebrews. And I pray that your spirit would teach each woman who hears these words and reads your word, that you would do a mighty work in her heart, Lord. I thank you again for your sovereignty and your grace and your forgiveness and for your redemption through your son, Jesus Christ, who is seated at your right hand and in his name we pray today. Amen.